Hello, this is Mary Thoreau from the Independent Institute, and I'm delighted today to be speaking with Chris Coyne, the author of our latest book, In Search of Monsters to Destroy, which you can see in back of me. Um, Chris, it's just I'm so delighted to get to talk with you. I've been a huge admirer of your work for many, many years, and of course, we've had the privilege of working with you on a, several projects. You've been co-editing our the Independent Review for... About a Six decade. Or seven. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> Whoa, time flies. It does. Okay. It does. And then we've also been able to uh, been able to publish several of your both sole authored and co authored papers in the Independent Review, which have been just stellar. Um, but this is the first book we've been able to get you to do with us. So I'm just delighted that you did, and it's a fabulous book, and I'm really looking forward to getting to talk to you about it. Um, I thought I'd start by, I'm curious, if you could tell us about sort of your intellectual journey. What what got you interested in these ideas? What brought you to where you are today? Sure. Well, well, first of all, thank you for, for taking the time to speak with me today. I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, and uh, as you were mentioning, we've had a long relationship uh, of me and the Independent Institute, and that will come up in a moment in my intellectual journey. Uh, but But really, it goes back to my junior year of undergraduate. Uh, at Manhattan College in New York City. Uh, so this would have been the late 90s. And I, I was fortunate enough to have uh, Pete Betke as a professor. Uh, he had been at NYU prior, uh, and he came to Manhattan College for, for one year before moving to George Mason. Uh, and of course, Pete is also uh, affiliated with the Independent Institute and has published several wonderful uh, uh, both articles and books uh, through Independent. And uh, Pete introduced me to Austrian economics and to public choice economics. And at the time, um, I was interested in economics, but I, I wasn't passionate about it. And, and that changed when I met Pete. And then Pete connected me uh, with a host of opportunities through uh, a variety of organizations and seminars that I attended over the summer as a student. Um, and I actually worked in finance. I worked down on uh, Wall Street for, I had already started as an undergraduate, and I worked there for two years after I graduated. But I kept in touch with Pete, and uh, after those two years, I decided to come back uh, and start my PhD at George Mason. Uh, and my first semester in graduate school was was um, September of 2001, which of course were the 9/11 attacks, which was the third week of my graduate education. And I had just come from New York City. I would <laughs> take the PATH train from Hoboken, New Jersey, into the World Trade Centers, and then walk down to Wall Street. So I just left yeah. there. And then, of course, the Pentagon was attacked uh, about 13 miles from, from George Mason University in Fairfax. Uh, right. And so that really opened the door for, for me to start studying these things and exploring them intellectually. Um, the other really important aspect of my intellectual development that first year was in the spring semester of my first year, I met Bob Higgs. Um, he was at a, a conference I attended, um, and he, through you know, very gratefully from my perspective, reached out to me, which was, um, you know, very rare for, for a senior professor to reach out to a graduate student. And um, he saw me present a paper at a conference and asked me to submit it to the Independent Review, um, which I did. And it was actually my first publication um, as a graduate student. And it gave me an enormous amount of confidence um, in terms of the ability to write a academic article and go through the publication process. But as you know, uh, Bob was just an amazing editor. Um, he was extremely constructive um, and, and uh, just made the the writing and the arguments so much sharper. I learned a great deal just going through that process. And of course, he and I uh, kept in touch after that and became increasingly closer through time. Um, and, and I very much find not just this book, but, but the research I work on in general um, to be inspired by him and, and very much in the, the research vein that he started. Um, and, and that, that's kind of the origins of, of my intellectual journey. And then since then, I've been working on a variety of issues related to foreign policy and liberty. Um, and of course, that was something that David was very uh, passionate about and created a lot of space for me to work on intellectually, as well as Bob Higgs. And so for that, I'm, I'm quite grateful. Yeah, of course, Bob was the founding editor of the Independent Review, and I really loved his sort of opening edit. Uh, statement that English is a language too. That's right. And and that's something we abide by to this day. And I, I, I reference it with my co-editors with some of the submissions we get. So uh, it's one, it's one of a right. kind in terms of, of that. Absolutely. And of course, we were 
privilege to get to work for with Bob for a long time. David, of course, worked for him, with him from very early days on Crisis and Leviathan, and then um, through his being research director with us, and we published, oh, I don't know, what, six or seven or eight books with Bob here. Um, and then, of course, it culminating in the establishment of the Independent Review, which is a great, uh, a great, uh, uh, the reputation is just growing, and you've been a big part of that as well. So thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, what what about Austrian economics got you excited when you got uh, introduced to it? Yeah, well, it was for the first time when I had Pete. It was it, it economics came alive, but the reason it came alive, part of it was Pete's passion. He's just a wonderful teacher. His book, Living Economics, which Independent published, I think makes that very clear for anyone anyone that reads it. His passion as a teacher just seeps through the pages. But it, for me, it brought economics alive from the standpoint I could actually understand how it related to the world. And so up to that point, my economics training was quite standard. Uh, and what I mean by that is there was a lot of emphasis on models, on graphs, on um, kind of equal equilibrium type theorizing, which is quite useful for understanding some things. But I could always remember thinking, you know, I did well in all my classes, but I always remember thinking, you know, what what is the what, what do you use this for? What how does it matter for the actual world? And I, I can I always remember one of the first days in Pete's class, he walked in and he said he was talking about central planning. And I didn't realize it at the time, but he said, why does this country have all these half finished buildings that government has invested so much money in, but when private entrepreneurs build buildings, um, you know, they're built relatively quickly, and then they fill them up. And what he, what he was trying to get us to think about was the role of prices, of profit and loss, and entrepreneurship and coordination. And I, I, that sticks in my mind, what is that, 25 years later? Because I remember at the, that moment as an undergraduate being like, wow, I never thought about this before. I never thought about all of the complexities and nuances that go into producing the most basic of items, and how different environments incentivize people and create different types of economic knowledge that allows them to do that. And that has real effects on human well-being, for better or for worse. And so once that hit me, it was off to the races. I just, I, I read a ton. And, and uh, after Pete left that year, I, I read a lot on my own. Um, and then, uh, you know, public choice then complemented that because then it made me realize, well, we can't just take for granted the government's going to do the things we want it to do. We might want them to do really nice things for people, but that is something that needs to be demonstrated rather than asserted. And when I combine yeah. these two things together in my head, the world started to make sense to me, and it's it's been kind of the scaffolding through which I, I understand the world ever since. Yeah. And, of course, public choice also tells us the people in government may very well want to be doing these things too, but it's just... It doesn't. It doesn't work. Um, I came at economics the opposite way. I was very fortunate to get exposed to Austrian economics in high school, and was similarly really on fire about it. I just thought it was the most exciting way of understanding the world, both historically and the world we live in. And then I got to college and declared economics as my major, and I sat there in these math classes, going, "When are we going to study economics?" <laughs> so it was. It was Quite a quite an interesting experience. I, I so I studied economics on the side is what I ended up doing. Um, on page one of the book, just to, to get started sure. at the beginning, um, you say you approach the study of empire through the lens of the economic way of thinking. What does that mean? Sure. Well, the the economic way of thinking is a few broad propositions that open up a. Uh, kind of window, if you will, for understanding all types of behaviors across time and geographic space. And and what we start with as economists is that people act. So so individuals are our object of study, um, and people act purposefully. They they want to achieve some goal. What that goal is, we we have to think about. We take as given from the people, like what do you want to accomplish? But that's our premise. And when I say individuals act. That doesn't mean we think the the world is is populated by atomistic individuals. We recognize that people are embedded in groups, and as you and I were just mentioning, people are in various organizations like government or like civil society or private firms. But people are the ultimate bedrock of our analysis because all phenomena that we want to understand can ultimately be traced back to individual actions. 
And so the premise is that people act and they act purposefully. The other kind of subsidiary propositions then that, that extend out of that are that uh, people respond to incentives. So when costs and benefits change from their perspective, their behavior will change. Um, and when you combine that with um, the idea of individuals acting along with the idea of things, something called subjectivism, the idea that people perceive the world through their mind. So all phenomena are filtered through the human mind. And why does this matter? It matters because costs and benefits, so people respond to incentives, changes in costs and benefits, but those costs and benefits are perceived by people and they're perceived differently. And this is really important for something like uh, policy, because oftentimes policymakers will say, well, we're going to do this for the good of society. Well, that presumes lots of things, but one of the things it presumes is that they know what's good for society. They somehow have access into the minds of all the people that constitute society and they can design and implement policies to bring that about. And once you start appreciating the, the role that subjectivism plays in the world, it creates enormous space for empowering individuals to engage in choice because they then are better able to pursue those things that are going to maximize benefits for them from their perspective. And so with that foundation in place, economists then can apply that logic to all different settings and all different topics to shed light on the world. And in this book, what I do is try to apply that logic to the role of U.S. empire, of foreign intervention, and the claim that a proactive militaristic foreign policy can make the world safer, bring order to the world, and all the while spread and reinforce liberal values. Let's pursue that for a minute and get clear on the definitions, because you do say that <clears throat> um, American empire claims to have a goal of spreading liberal values, but the very means of spreading it through empire building is illiberal. So can you explain that a little bit more, what you mean by liberal and illiberal? Sure. So, so one of the things as part of the economic way of thinking that we, we, we do as, as analysts is take the ends as given. So we, we take people at their word. Um, e even if even if there's reason to believe they're they're being disingenuous, and so the reason I say that is because oftentimes I'll say, well, people in government in the U.S. government have repeatedly across administrations for decades have said their foreign policy is meant to spread freedom, spread liberty, liberty, make the world safer. Democracy, of course, is one manifestation of this. And some people say, well, that's just them saying that they don't really want to do that, and that might be the case, but. For charitable purposes, analytical, we don't impose our views on them. We take that as given and then analyze it. And so what is liberalism? Liberalism is a political philosophy that starts with the individual and starts with the individual as their ultimate sovereign. Uh, and so it emphasizes the role of, of individual choice, human dignity, um, freedom of association, that freedom of association cuts across all different areas in life. So it's it's social interactions. I can interact with group other people that I, I want to interact with and vice versa voluntarily. Uh, freedom of religion, uh, economic freedom, um, and, and so on throughout throughout our, our life. So it's it's the the freedom to interact with other people voluntarily. It also places a very strong emphasis on human creativity. So the ability of people, ordinary people, to use their uh, creativity to figure out challenging problems. Uh, and out of that, or related to that, is the idea of spontaneous order, that many of the things that allow us to live in a world uh, peacefully with other people and to have what Adam Smith called an extended division of labor, that is to interact with people beyond our very close social groups, our, our family and friends, is spontaneous order, that, that there is an order that emerges without anyone designing it. And it's so complex that no one could design it. And that attempts to use human reason to bring order to something actually is disorderly and chaotic. Uh, and uh, so that's the, the premise of it. It also emphasizes a cosmopolitan view of the world. So it views the, the world as one of also populated with other people. And if we're going to allow for freedom of association, we have to allow for freedom of association across geographic space as well. Uh, and right. respect the dignity of people, um, regardless of, of of their geographic location and so on. And so that's the the, the kind of main tenets of what liberalism is. Um, 
then the question becomes, do, do the people that operate the U.S. government, what I call the U.S. empire, have the appropriate means to bring about liberalism abroad? And in the book, I argue they don't. They don't and it's not like they don't have the means available to them. It's that the very activity of attempting to do it undermines liberal values and has to undermine liberal values. Okay. Um, at the beginning of the book, you say uh, the failures in Afghanistan present a unique opportunity. The curtain has been pulled back on the American empire once again, offering us yet again another chance to critically assess the features and realities of empire and to chart a new course. This book does just that. I explore the various aspects of the American empire, including the nature and limits of military imperialism abroad and the harmful effects of militarism at home. So let's start with that. Um, let's start with the nature and limits of military imperialism abroad. Um, and you give several poignant examples of that um, in the book. Uh, you talk about the impact in Latin America, the enduring impact in Latin America, um, which you cite as an ideological backlash against liberal democratic, political, economic, and social systems. Yeah. So so the idea, and, and first just turn to Afghanistan very quickly, there was the opportunity to reflect, and it went away very quickly, of course, with, with the U.S. <laughs> response to Ukraine, um, which, which has kind yeah. of led to a renewed call for doubling down on American empire. We can return to that later. Um, the, let me start at the kind of the conceptual level, and we can move to some specific examples. So at the conceptual level, in order to intervene abroad, you have to think about what it entails and, and what any government intervention is, whether domestic or foreign, is the following. It is the discretionary use of power by a small group of political elite to bring about their desired state of affairs. And that desired state of affairs differs from the status quo. It has to. If it didn't differ from the status quo, there'd be no urge to intervene in the first place. So the very reason to intervene is to say, I don't like what people are doing. I want to change their behavior. And then what happens? Well, that requires one of two things. Either you say, please change your behavior, and they do so voluntarily, in which case you don't really need to intervene beyond that because we're going to do what you want. But more often than not, that doesn't happen. What happens is you intervene and you want the people to change their behavior, the people you are intervening upon. They don't do it voluntarily. So then you have to resort to force, resort to some form of coercion in order to force them, in other words, in economic terms, to raise the cost of deviating from the type of behavior you want them to do. Well, what does that require? An entire apparatus of coercion, which is the apparatus of empire, as I discuss in the book. That's why it's fundamentally illiberal. It, it is requires one group of external actors, a group of a small group of political elite, to intervene upon other people to say that um, you can't engage in self determination. So we're going to tell you what to do, uh, and then we're going to backstop it with force. Um, and that creates a, a, a number of unintended consequences. You, you mentioned Latin America, which I talk about at the beginning of the book. Uh, and the U.S. government has a long history of intervening in Latin America. Uh, and some of those are direct interventions, so uh, direct military interventions and occupations. Others are the um, funding and support of various coups to overthrow governments, to prop up client states uh, in order to support U.S. foreign policy goals. Uh, during the Cold War, of course, this was these kind of proxy wars that were going on to push back against communism uh, uh, were, were ubiquitous, uh, not just in Latin America, but around the world. And uh, even to this day, many people say, well, that's good. It helped push back against communism, perhaps, but at what cost? One of the, the things it did was to kind of cement what one historian refers to as inevitable revolutions which is that once you normalize tyranny and repression as a way of operating in the political space, uh, that's what becomes normalized. And so in many countries in Latin America, the U.S. government propped up and supported purposefully brutal regimes, which benefited them in the short run, perhaps. In some cases, it didn't even do that. But that became the way things were operated. And then in order to overthrow totalitarian regimes, you usually need some kind of revolution. And then the way you establish the political order is through violence, both the repression of people and then the pushback to get change. And among other things, as, as you mentioned, this has led to a pushback, not just against America, but that which American leaders purport to stand for. 
And so if you listen to, you hear this right now in, in Ukraine, if you listen to American politicians, all their foreign policy is grounded in the rhetoric of freedom, of liberty, of self-determination. And so what happens for the people on the ground when they are being intervened upon? They don't necessarily view it that way, of course. Just like, you know, one of the thought experiments I often give when I'm talking about these things is, imagine there was a, one of the many situations of discord in America. Uh, and, and we have breakouts of violence, of, of violence on the streets throughout the country at various points of time. And imagine Canada or a foreign country said, oh my gosh, that city in, in America is a weak and failed state. They can't protect the citizens. We're going to go intervene and bring order to them. And they, they had the military on the ground and they had drones overhead. How do you think Americans and the American government and people on the ground would act? Well, we have, a, we have an idea. We just saw some balloons flying above America and everyone kind of lost their mind that, that China and other countries were, were invading America. Uh, the point being that they would react quite harshly. Uh, and so it, it's a lack of self-awareness, uh, from my perspective, uh, of those in the American government and the supporters of American empire to appreciate how people on the ground are viewing being intervened upon. And that's why this idea of subjectivism is so important. What people externally might view as good or necessary isn't necessarily how people on the ground might view it. Uh, and then that opens the door to you doing real harm to them and to future generations of people due to these interventions. You also point out there's always the argument, well, it, it could have worked if only, you know, everything had been lined up exactly right. And you point out um, the example of uh, Libya, where Obama, so Obama laid out absolutely all the conditions were ex exactly right, and still it's a mess, right? He said... Uh, you know, we had, it didn't cost that much. We had the support. Uh, we got a UN mandate. We built a coalition. It cost us a billion dollars, which isn't that much. We averted large scale civilian casualties. We prevented what was almost surely would have been a prolonged and bloody civil conflict. And despite all that, Libya is a mess. So again, everything can seemingly be exactly according to the rule book of, you know, rest building, spreading democracy 101, and it doesn't quite turn out that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. So that's a perfect example. I highlight that in the book because, of course, one of the things I want to highlight in, in the story I'm trying to tell is this is a bipartisan issue. So it's not if Republicans are in charge or Democrats are in charge, it's better or worse. They suffer from the same constraints. There's changes of policy, of course, across administrations. But it's the same logic. And of course, one of the things Obama was heralded for, and of course, he won a Peace Prize for it. And the Peace Prize was, was not being George W. Bush. And, and uh, it was supposed to be this dramatic change. But of course, Obama ramped up the use of drones. But also, he, he ramped up uh, interventions in other areas, Lib Libya being one. And, and, and at the time, everyone in, in the mainstream media uh, and, and in the policy establishments were hailing this as the new way. No boots on the ground. You're just going to have the kind of a, a broad mandate and, and a light footprint, and we're going to get this regime change. Uh, but, you know, it, it seems like common sense to ask, well, what about what's going to happen tomorrow? Uh, if we overthrow a government, uh, what, what's tomorrow going to look like in the next day? Uh, you know, liberal democracy doesn't fall from on high. It's not something that you just, you know, give a book to someone and they read it and then voila, you have it. Uh, and uh, it led to not just a, a brutal civil war with the deaths of many uh, innocent civilians in Libya, but also the U.S., for those who are familiar, ended up in, a, in quite an interesting spot because they started funding certain groups of people to, again, attempt to bring order to the chaos they created. Those groups were the same groups they were fighting in Afghanistan. So affiliated groups with ISIS and affiliated groups with al-Qaeda. And so then you end up in these bizarre tensions where you're simultaneously fighting these groups in one geographic location as part of the war on terror and funding them and supporting them in, in another part of, of, of the world. And... Uh, very rarely do these kind of entanglements and tensions in these policy get pointed out, but you quickly realize that it's just a mess, even at, like you said, under the best of conditions. So think about what happens when you deviate from those supposedly first best conditions. Exactly. You mentioned the use of drones, and I thought one of the most poignant paragraphs in the book uh, was the testimony of a 13-year-old boy whose 
grandmother had been killed by a drone strike in Pakistan. <clears throat> and I'm quoting, quoting, you're quoting the grandson. Now I prefer cloudy days when the drones don't fly, when the sky brightens and becomes blue, the drones return and so does the fear. Children don't play so often now and have stopped going to school. Education isn't possible as long as the drones circle overhead. Yet. And I think if most Americans were aware or uh, exposed to a 13-year-old giving testimony like that, they might ideally rethink it as this wonderful solution to our having to help help other countries. Yes, certainly. And, and part of this goes back to where we started, the premise of the economic way of thinking. And one of the things I highlighted there was the, the role, focus on the individual. And I, I emphasize that it's not just an analytical point, but it matters for all policy, not foreign policy and domestic policy, which is we are dealing with human beings. These are human beings we are acting upon. And especially in war making, it matters because wars are always going to do real and irreparable harm to innocent people. Always. It cannot be avoided in modern warfare because of the nature of weapons. So we're not talking, you know, a bow and arrow where you can shoot and it, it hits a person. And then, of course, you can make a mistake and, and have collateral damage. But w with the the expansion and the nature of warfare, the technology of it, now you can do significant damage, both direct harm, maiming, killing people, but also psychological harm to people and not think twice about it. And you can do it from a distance. Uh, and that's really something we need to we need to think about and ponder. And what happens, and one of the, the issues I raised throughout the book is that empire is collectivism. It, it is collectivism because domestically, so within the United States, people, it is said, have to sacrifice for the good of the country. So we're doing this for freedom of the country. That's the language of collectivism. Right. Abroad, we are fighting against... Af the bad people in Afghanistan, supposedly. But then that even gets aggregated into just Afghanistan. Or now, what are the big threats? Russia and China. Which, again, in shorthand, we know geographically what that means. But what happens is policy gets collapsed into the U.S. government is attacking or fighting China, and China is attacking us, as if, as if anyone in the Chinese geographic space is an enemy, as if anyone in the Russian geographic space is an enemy. And once you start thinking in those terms, you can see why it's okay, you feel comfortable flying a drone over and doing irreparable harm to innocent people because, hey, you know, they're, they're one of the enemies. Uh, and, and so once you start appreciating that these are human beings, uh, and, and certainly that recognizing that doesn't mean that there's not good and bad people. Of course there are, it, but that's everywhere, by the way, even in the United States. Uh, and it should give you pause to my way of thinking to say we better be really careful. The bar has to be really high because we are going to necessarily hurt innocent people if we do this. And so we better be extremely certain that we want to undertake this action and there are checks in place to minimize that. And to, in my analysis, there there's very few checks. Uh, and uh, uh, again, you know, you, you, you hurt millions of people abroad. I'm talking about the war on terror. And now it's old news. We don't even talk about it anymore. Uh, uh, and to the extent we do talk about it, people talk about it. Okay. You know, we need more resources and better planning for the next one. Not that let's actually step back and reflect and look in the mirror and think about what can and cannot be accomplished. And are there better ways to go about navigating conflict and fostering peace without resorting to violence? And that's one of the things I, I think is important to make clear. The, the argument I'm laying out in the book is not some utopian peace, Nick, if we all just say the word love or hug more, even though I, I think if we did that more, it might be good. But uh, it's not that the, all the world, world's ills are solved automatically. There's always going to be conflict. That's a social constant. But the way we respond to conflict is an object of choice. And we can respond to conflict by in utilizing the tools of militarism and violence or we can resort to conflict by finding peaceful ways to live together, even though we might disagree strongly in some cases with the way that other people are living their life. And we know that the costs of resorting to violence are significant and enormous, especially for, for the most vulnerable people in the world. So to my way of thinking, that needs to be avoided at all costs. 
Um, not, not, it shouldn't be the primary means of inter international relations, which it seems like it's what it's become. Well, and the best check, of course, as you say, is is ideological and, and understanding fundamental principles. So David Thoreau was always very fond of reminding us at Independent that we're rooted in methodological individualism, that there are no groups, there are only individuals, and we mustn't try to lump people together as groups. And that was what was so, well, that was, many things were very disturbing, very, very, very disturbing to him on 9-11 when he insisted we post on our webpage that afternoon a statement um, warning against it being used uh, for the government to take on new roles. But in its aftermath, especially when so many people um, that he thought shared these values were calling for mass warfare and understanding that that meant killing innocent people. And just he could not understand how people he thought understood that every human being is unique and valuable, um, and yet you're going to punish them for the acts of other individuals. So it's a, it's a terribly slippery slope that even the best... Uh, Best people can be subject to, but it's a it's a it's a message that can't be reiterated enough, and it's it's the only thing that ultimately will be the check against a continuation of this. Um, let's let's move on. I could we could talk. I could talk with you for several hours, and you might be nice enough to let me. But <laughs> anyway, in the interest of time, let's go to your second part, which is the the harmful effects of militarism at home. Yeah, so um, I, the way I approach this part of it, the, the harmful effects at home, is is by thinking about what does it require to run and operate a, a, a empire apparatus that requires enormous amounts of resources. It requires enormous amounts of, of government, uh, and 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 what I mean by that is number one, simply a significant number of government bureaus, both in size and scale, to carry out the day-to-day -day activities, but also the concentration of a significant amount of political power in the hands of a small group of people. And so let me unpack those three things a little more, and I'll start with, with political power. Throughout history, not just in America, even though the, the founders of America, James Madison and others talked about this, people have recognized that war making is the health of political power and the health of the state, where the state is the coercive apparatus that implements and uh, implements uh, 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 government policy and has a monopoly over force of whatever geographic space we're talking about. And uh, right there, that should give us significant pause because it, it undermines things in America, for instance, like the federalist system, the federalist system being the idea that, that there's a separation of powers between the, the, the federal and the, and the states in order to check what any one level can do. But war making, and you see this in the war on terror as you were just talking, what David's concern was, was that this was going to centralize an enormous amount of power in the hands of a small group of people. And, the, and on top of that, the very nature of what's called the war on terror is not really a war. It's like the war on drugs. What would it mean to win the war on terror? Terror it, it has been with us since time immemorial. It's not, it's not a, a nine, post-9-11 phenomena. And, and it, it's unclear what it would mean to eradicate or to beat the enemy of, of terrorism. The, the problem being that twofold. One, it's open-ended and it can go on forever. Number two, anyone, and I mean anyone, is possible of being a terrorist, which means that anyone, including U.S. persons, are potential enemies. And this reinforces the concentration of power because it's not just like you're making more tanks or, or more guns. You are doing that. But you're also saying, well, now we need the, the power to access your financial records, to surveil you, to, and, and, and if you don't allow for it, what are we told? You're not a patriot. You're not an American. You don't care about safety, uh, right? The, the standard saying is, well, if you have nothing to hide, uh, uh, then, then you have nothing to worry about. Uh, which, of right. course, is the, is the death knell of, of freedom and liberty the minute you say that. Um, and so that's the concentration of PowerPoint. Then you just have a, 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 a growth of bureaucracies, 
uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, you know, for, for those who, who think this is hyperbole, perhaps, go look at the organizational chart of the Dep Department of Homeland Security in its initial iteration in, what, 2002, I guess, and look at it now. And look at the just the organizational chart and just look at the massive growth of this agency through that time. And that's just one slice of the national security state. Um, it, it's enormous. The number of private contractors, the number of amount of money that went to the, uh, the, the, the war on terror and continues to be spent on is just mind blowing once you start actually paying attention to it. And of course, the U.S. government, which is the just a the, the, the national security state can't keep track of it. And so one of the things that, that just came out recently, now I guess it's a couple months old, is that the Pentagon had again failed an, an audit. But under federal law, the major agencies are required by law to pass an audit. Uh, and it took the, the Pentagon decades to even subject itself to an audit. So it was operating illegally under federal law, uh, but it's failed repeatedly. Um, and so it's just massive waste, fraud, and abuse, as we would expect. Um, but then the other thing, and the, th the third part I want to highlight, is the amount of resources that, that are spent on this. And so the U.S. defense budget um, is growing, of course, now, but it's long, long been significant, and it's long been over a trillion dollars once, once you take into account all spending. And so a lot of people focus just on what's called the base budget of the Pentagon, which is enormous unto itself. But you also need to take into account things like, well, the Department of Energy houses part of the uh, nuclear program. The Department of Homeland Security I mentioned earlier, the overseas contingency budget, which is basically this line item that was created as part of the war on terror to, 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 to run money through to carry out the war on terror without having to get it authorized through normal channels. You have interest on the debt that's associated with running the, the, the national security state. And of course, you have um, the various costs of running the Veterans Administration, health care, benefits, and all that well over a trillion dollars, and you ask yourself, well, where does that money come from? Uh, again, people act like, well, they just get the money. Uh, no, it's either pulled from the private sector or you have to issue debt in order to, to finance it, which is simply pushing off those obligations into the future. In either case, real resources are being pulled out of the private economy, but more so than just paper money, you also redirect people's creativity and alertness entrepreneurs who otherwise would be directing their efforts to improve the well-being of private people are redirected to satisfying their government, their political customers. And so you read these stories about these engineers who are extremely intelligent people, extremely well-trained, and instead of working in the private sector, or perhaps they work in the private sector, but then they're contracted with, with government, they redirect their efforts to uh, uh, you know, improving the government's ability to engage in war making, to engage in destruction rather than creation. And these resources are enormous uh, and they are often neglected. Uh, and, and this is, you know, a lot of people refer to limited government as just providing defense and protection. Uh, this is a terrible example of limited government once you actually start studying the breadth of this apparatus. Uh, because uh, once you start studying all the different ways that the military sector affects domestic economic life, you realize it's everywhere. It, it touches upon almost every aspect of domestic life. Uh, and uh, uh, that's something that we need to take into account when we think about the domestic effects um, of, of, of empire. Yeah, it is extraordinary that when the Department of Defense couldn't even defend its own building, nobody questioned that is the Department of Defense doing a good job? They just added another layer of bureaucracy with the Department of Homeland Security as if Homeland Security were different from defense or something uh, extraordinary. There's no no stopping and thinking. And then, of course, as you mentioned, there's the whole apparatus of the deep state that just um, has, uh, has some early whistleblowers from the NSA pre-Edward Snowden said, you know, in the aftermath of 9-11, the U.S. government decoupled itself completely from the Constitution, um, and we've been seeing the aftermath of that. And, of course, now we don't see it because all the whistleblowers have been utterly silenced between Obama invoking the Espionage Act against more people than had been charged in the 100 years since it was enacted to um, Snowden's being stranded in Russia, the other NSA whistleblowers having their lives ruined, being again being threatened with life imprisonment and so forth. It's 
probably not surprising that nobody's come forward to blow the whistle since Snowden. Um, and so we can only imagine how much farther the deep state has gone in those, what, no, it's more than 10 years now. Um, so frightening. Um, and yet people seem very inured to it. Well, you know, we, well, we know we have no privacy. But do we know what that means? Do we understand that every word we say, everything we type, every search, every transaction is being stored in a facility to be mined at will? And uh, as show me the man and I'll give you the crime. Uh, you know, they just, I, I don't think, of course, you don't want to think about it on a day to day basis. You don't want to live under that sort of constant fear of, you know, what might happen to me because of this apparatus that's infiltrated my everyday life. But I think most fundamentally, and we used to do these summer seminars for students, and I would channel you <laughs> in a presentation I would do, I gave often on um, uh, the militarization of the police and, and, uh, and, the, and the deep state and so on. And the interesting thing that occurred to me before I was speaking to one class is I realized they were so young they wouldn't have any consciousness of what Ameri the culture, the attitude of Americans before 9-11 and after 9-11. And of course now everybody's born after then, so they really wouldn't know. But And I would try to explain to them that in the late 20th century, the general attitude in America was complete, uh, we can do anything, we're, we're a, our ingenuity can solve any problem. Uh, the problems of the present are going to be solved with the wonderful new advances we're doing with technology and, and so on. And after 9-11, it was just this switch to, to fear and, and uh, you know, the government has to keep us safe from all these boogeymen and obviously was exploited by people who wanted us to be in a state of fear. And of course, under COVID, that was just exploited even further to, to again, weaken us to where we think we can't be agents of change for ourselves. You talked about Tocqueville in your book and how um, he talked about the great associations that we, we traditionally did to solve our own problems together. Um, so I think the cultural shift has been um, just enormous and pervasive uh, do you see hope for a change of that? Oh, first of all, I, I certainly agree. You know, I, I have two daughters. One one is 10 and one's four. And and it's exactly what you said. They'll never know. Well, we'll my wife and I, of course, will try to explain to them. But they, in their life, they were born into the world post 9-11 and, and everything they know um, is normalized for them. So when we go through an airport in, in America and you still do all the silliness of the shoes and the three ounces to them, that's normal. Um, the, ability, the, the, the possibility of getting patted down the way... Where, where pre 9 11, if anyone tried to touch you like that, uh, it would it would just be not just obnoxious but illegal. Uh, uh, you couldn't do that to people. Yeah. Um, but now, just the way it is, uh, and and so you're you're certainly and, and and one of the great successes of government through time has been not just convincing people that it's necessary, but normalizing it and making it that this is how it it, it is, and, and then it desensitizes you to it to the extent to to the extent that. You know, going through that at the airport's just like going through anything else in life, um, and 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 they're not they're not the same thing. Um, and of course, you pointed out the shift after nine eleven and and with COVID. And of course, the other thing I would just highlight is the financial crisis and how the the two thousand eight financial crisis, um, in in conjunction with nine eleven and COVID, has led to I, I think. And again, this is coming from my own experience interacting with with younger people, younger students in college as well at the undergraduate level has led to this pushback of not just fear, but also a strong skepticism of markets, a, a strong skepticism of the ability of individuals, as you put it quite nicely, to kind of flex their ability to self-govern and come up with creative solutions to, to not just economic problems, but just social problems in general. And this dependency on, on the state uh, and this kind of apathy towards the alternative. And that's quite troubling. Um, I, I do think there's reason for for optimism, and 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 let me say this: um, 
the the reason I think there's there's reason for optimism is throughout history, of course, we've had ebbs and flows in this kind of thing, not just in America, but around the world throughout human history. And there have been times, uh, and it's not too long ago, um, where, I mean, remember before the collapse of, of, uh, of the Soviet Union, of course, there, it, there was not just people around the world that believed in communism, but in America, there were academics, which I know you're, you're fully well aware of, that were making the argument that the Soviet Union was going to surpass, um, the, surpass the United States. There was a small group of people that pushed back against it. So you had, for instance, War, uh, Warren Nutter at UVA, his student Paul Craig Roberts. Um, you had Murray Rothbard. The, these, this small group of scholars said, well, wait a second, you know, something is amiss with these growth numbers. Um, you, you say this- And Robert Conquest. Yes, exactly. It, you yeah. say the Soviet Union's grown like gangbusters, but people are waiting for hours for a loaf of bread, uh, something something's amiss here, um, and uh, uh, that then uh, uh, was quite a, a pessimistic time for those that believed in freedom and markets and so on. Uh, but but markets persevered, um, and that doesn't mean they always will. Of course, uh, there can be enough squashing them out where it goes away. Uh, but you know, one of the things that gives me hope is that there is still some space for people to exercise that freedom to exercise self-governing kind of uh, capabilities. Um, it's smaller than perhaps it was prior, um, but it's still there. And you know, one of the things I, I think is quite important, and, and I try to do it myself, and, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm quite grateful to, to partner with everything that Independent does, is there are still some organizations that are dedicated to promoting those core values, and not just promoting them in terms of saying the words, but in terms of engaging in scholarship, in great, engaging in uh, uh, interaction with policy directly in terms of engaging what's happening day to day, um, and, and sticking, having the courage of con one's convictions. And so there are, are people, and of course, I'm sitting close to Washington, D.C. than you are, and I know David always wanted to keep a distance. By per on uh, purpose. Yes, I was going to say, I know David was always, <laughs> uh, always very wary of this, and it's one thing I, I, I very much appreciated about him was when you try to influence policy in Washington, D.C. on a day-to-day -day basis, you're going to have to give up a significant amount of ground. You just have to in order to play the game. Uh, and, and you, but then when you give up those principles, when, when, the, when, the, when the principles are given up in order to compromise, to get whatever it is, to get a seat at the table today at, at, the, at the discussion, those principles are gone. No one is defending them anymore. No one is, is pointing out the central role they play in a free society of dignified individuals. Um, no one is doing scholarship on how those principles relate to today. Uh, and, and that's what, I, what gives me hope is there's that space for that still. Uh, and uh, uh, whether that is a, a false optimism or not, I don't know, but it's what keeps me going on a daily basis. Well, I want to spend a significant amount of time because you don't only just tell us what it's gone wrong with empire abroad and at home. You do uh, lo offer a potential path forward, which is very important. And then um, the title of the book, In Search of Monsters to Destroy, comes from an address that John Quincy Adams made to Congress on the 4th of July, 1821. What was the context of that address? Why did he feel it necessary to, to remind Congress of these Principles. Yeah. Well, well, he feared, like many others, that there, and he recognized, which is what I was saying earlier about there being a long history of of the interventionist mindset. So um, he recognized that there was going to be an inherent pressure and tension for members of Congress to expand beyond their constitutional and assigned duties and to uh, 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 engage in activities both domestically and abroad, which would undermine what he considered to be the American spirit. Um, and, and part of that American spirit was, was a commitment to the values that you and I were discussing earlier. Um, and of course, uh, he wasn't the only person to voice this concern. Um, George Washington voiced it. I mentioned James Madison earlier. Uh, and so it was, it was, they were fully aware of the concern, but they're also fully aware of the incentives in government. They didn't call it the incentives in government. We would call it that today, but they recognize that, that there was a incentive to engage in these activities where you were spreading costs among large numbers of people. 
Um, but what do you give up when you do that? You give up the very premise of the things you purport to want to defend. And one of the reasons, and, and David played a, a central role in selecting that title, so he gets he gets credit for, for, for pushing me to, to, to adopt that title, is that people will say today, well, that's back then. That doesn't apply to today. Uh, no, it, it applies more so today uh, because all of the things he warned about have not just come to fruition, but they've come to fruition on a much grander scale. And so we need to be reminded of what happens when you a adopt a proactive foreign policy. That's the going in search of monsters to destroy. It's not just that there's someone who is in your face attacking you directly. I need to go out in the world and seek out the monsters preemptively to stop them from doing things they might do in the future. And what does that sound like? Well, it sounds like the U.S. government certainly throughout a prolonged period of time, but if we just want to stick to, to post 9-11, what was the argument? The U.S. needs to go around the, the world to root out terrorism. We won't stop until all terrorism is stopped. And now we need to go and counterbalance Russia and China. We need to take these proactive steps around the world. That's going out in search of monsters. You are proactively looking for enemies to defeat for what might happen, for, for a possibility, without any regard for the concrete costs, the actual things that are going to happen when you adopt those policies. And that's what the, the book is trying to get people to think about. Yeah. He, and relevant to Ukraine, part of the talk was uh, America well knows that by once enlisting under other banners than her own, were they even the banners of foreign independence? She would involve herself beyond the power of extrication. Um, so, as we're we're embroiled in Ukraine and to help the independence of it, and and uh, it's it's a very noble cause, so we ought to be doing it um, at great cost. But I do want to spend I do want to spend time. We're running out of time. About your your solution and the whole uh, concept of um, politics polycentrism, or what you call people power, I heard you call people power. Um, can you explain to me why that's not a naive kumbaya concept? Yes. So, so um, you know, this comes at the end of the book. So what are we going to do about this? What are the paths to peace? The, the, the way things are set up right now is that the centralized national security state is the path to peace. And I, I don't want to just critique it, but also offer an alternative. And so to my way of thinking, the alternative has to be grounded in individuals. It has to be grounded in people. The state, this thing we call the state, is not going to save us. It's not our savior. It is not, it is not the, the way to peace and to order in the world. It is the people that live uh, uh, all around the world. But let's just focus on the United States for the purposes of our discussion. One of the things that I think people neglect because of all the way these conversations are, are phrased and set up, which is all around the need for the state and war making, is they neglect the role that ordinary people play in peacemaking. And, and there's a couple of things I just want to highlight. And I, one of them I highlighted earlier, which is that this is not an, a naive argument that conflict doesn't exist, that there aren't threats to people. Of course, those threats are ubiquitous. But here's the thing you need to keep in mind. When you empower government to protect you, you are creating a threat. The government is a threat to your liberty. And so you can never escape that dilemma. Empowering government to do stuff in the name of protecting your liberty creates a threat, a different type of threat, but a threat, and perhaps a more dangerous one because you are centralizing an enormous amount of power in the hands of a small group of people, as we were talking about earlier, that have the power to surveil you, control you, imprison you, and so on. So what does that mean? Well, I want people to just, I, I walked through a thought experiment in the book to, to get people to think about this which is that, uh, you know, think about your daily life. We walk around in our daily life and we navigate conflicts constantly from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed. We, uh, many of us live in a house with other people and you might bo both be going to make a cup of coffee, you and your significant other in the morning, but only one person can use the coffee maker at the, a point in time. That's a moment of conflict. You're tired, you want your caffeine. Most of us don't resolve that violently. Uh, if you have kids, uh, uh, you, you know full well that, that oftentimes they both want to control what's on TV. 
uh, and, and, and there's ways to resolve that peacefully. Then you go to work uh, and you resolve conflicts with your colleagues peacefully. And why do I say this? Because these mundane moments highlight a really important point, which is that all of us have the power to be peacemakers. And we are peacemakers. We navigate conflict without resorting to violence. Now, some at times people do resort to violence, but those are considered outliers. Those are considered taboo because that's not the appropriate way to interact with people. Once you recognize that, then it's just a matter of scaling that logic up because then people say, well, how does that relate to international relations? The same way it relates to domestic relations, which is that when you appreciate methodological individualism, going back to where we started, rather than the nation state and nationalism and collectivism, you recognize that international relations are always human relations. They are interactions between human beings. So just like people domestically can interact and navigate conflict and have to learn how to do that. The other thing I point out in the book is that uh, uh, the idea of peace, people think of a society as either peaceful or not peaceful. So peace is kind of this state of affairs that either exists or doesn't exist. And that's not quite right. Peace is a process. It's an ongoing process and something we all have to learn and develop skills from the youngest of ages is how to navigate conflict peacefully. Just think back to, to you know, the kind of schoolyard and the sandbox. Uh, and, and, and at least my parents, one of the first things they taught me is you don't hit people, you don't take their stuff. Um, you have to learn to get along with other people. But we forget that somehow when we become adults, and government certainly forgets that. They like hitting people and taking their stuff. Uh, but why is that our default that we go to? Why not just say, uh, look, as a default, we need to focus on peaceful means of resolving conflict. And of course, violence might break out. It certainly will. It does every day, even within the United States. But we, what we want to do is minimize that. And how do you minimize it? You make it taboo to resort, resort to violence. And people do this all the time. In our daily lives, it would be, it's considered taboo to engage in violence against other people. We navigate things peacefully. We should make moves to, nav to, to make it taboo internationally and to empower people to figure out ways to live peacefully together. And that's the idea behind polycentric peace. Polycentricism is this idea of, um, to contrast it, a monocentric system is there's one centralized decision-making unit that controls everything. That's the national government. It's a monocentric unit. A polycentric unit is when there's numerous small sub-decision-making sub, uh, units. And one of the benefits of polycentricism is it empowers diversity and creativity. And what I mean by diversity here is not kind of in the modern speak of whether it's religion or race or gender, even though those are certainly margins of diversity as well, but in the ability to see the world differently, that different people see the world differently through what the economist Julian Simon called the ultimate resource. The ultimate resource is the human mind. Why do, we, why, why do I highlight that? Because that is what improves the world. The fact that someone else sees an improvement that I don't see, and they have the freedom and the space, the elbow room, to act upon that. And what I want to do is expend that, extend that logic to peacemaking as well. And so that then pushes us to think about all the different ways that we can expand the scope of people to engage in creative peacemaking. And so removing barriers to human interaction, to trade, and I don't mean just trade in physical items, but just interactions between people. That's the way people can figure out how to live peacefully together. And so to kind of turn over a, 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 a standard phrase that people use uh, oftentimes, which is they'll say things like, well, the, if you want peace, prepare for war. The idea being that peace comes out of war. <laughs> how about this? To prepare for peace, make peace. And so... Our, our default should always be a per, what I call a presumption of peace. Uh, a presumption of peace is we always start from the premise that there is a way to have nonviolent solutions to a dilemma. That doesn't mean that's always going to happen, but that's very different than saying we have to have all this military buildup. We have to position our troops and our boats and our military bases so that we can balance power and so that we can easily intervene around the world in order to uh, bring order to the world. Uh, to the extent this is peace, it's a form of jackboot peace. It's a it's peace grounded in force or the threat thereof, uh, and, and it's not a genuine sustainable peace. And so, in 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 a in, in a 
what I think is a very obvious way, but what appears counterintuitive to people is when you take the position of if you want peace, prepare for war, you're going to get war. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy because you've defined peace as war making or the possibility of doing it. And so I want to shift that narrative and get people to focus on unleashing the ability of ordinary people to engage in peacemaking. And instead of turning to our political masters as our saviors, say that we have the power individually to bring about peace and we do it every single day in our lives. And once you recognize that, it also makes it clear that we have the power to do that with other people as well. Just because they happen to be born or reside in a different geographic space doesn't mean we lose those capabilities. We don't think in those terms, but we don't think about in those terms only because we've been trained not to think in those terms. We've been trained to think about we can't do it. Only government can do it. Uh, but that's not the case. And I want people to hopefully realize that and start thinking about what the implications of that might look like. Yeah, you say in the book that um, national security is, is seen as the quintessential public good. Here at Independent, we've always pointed to the lighthouses, <laughs> was seen as the quintessential public good until Ronald Coase asserted that it wasn't, that it was, in fact, they were, in fact, created by entrepreneurs. And it's the same thing when people ask me, uh, you know, well, if the government weren't doing this, you know, how would it how would it work? And that's the point is, I don't know, because there's so much creativity, so many entrepreneurs, including social entrepreneurs, that we can't know what people will create. It's like if we said in the 90s, um, you know, if the government were in charge of telecommunications, we'd all still have one black phone that hung on the wall, you know. And instead, we have all these enormous things that nobody could have foreseen um, or planned or centrally planned. We set people free to imagine and create and devise new ways of relating. I think we'd similarly see um, enormously creative things. One of the things we did post 9-11 was we had a, um, a big event in San Francisco with uh, Gore Vidal, who just published his book, uh, um, Endless, endless war for endless peace, and um, was one of the few people who was speaking out for peace. So we had an event with him, with Lewis Lapham, and but obviously needed to offset some of his viewpoints with uh, the more liberty-minded. So we had a panel with it, which included people like Bart Bernstein and Bob Higgs, and uh, it was at a big theater in San Francisco, and in fact. One of our friends came in and said, there's scalpers out front. You know you've made it. <laughs> so, but, you know, the audience was, was almost purely left liberal because um, that's who was talking about peace at the time. And they were all, they were with us 100% loving, you know, love fest for the event. And then Bob Higgs came out with, uh, where, where goods will not cross borders, soldiers will. And they, you know, they're booing <laughs> And gasping. So, you know, it's a it's an interesting world in which to sell these ideas, but uh, I think that we can make them attractive ideally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is helpful to have some um, examples to cite to people because they'll just keep pushing back of, oh, no, that wouldn't happen or, you know, that's fine domestically, but how's it going to work when you're facing existential threats like you know, China and their balloons and so on. Um, so uh, I, you talk about several interesting things, uh, for especially for def national defense and, and security uh, domestically, about heightened awareness among the citizenry being very important. And you cite the passengers on Flight 93 versus um, the government response to the other flights. And, of course, there were reports that uh, the the flight schools were reporting to the FBI about these people taking lessons to fly but not land, and the FBI ignored them. And, of course, if, so if you had heightened awareness about, well, maybe we should follow through on people who are, who are pursuing activities like this and, and actually take action about it. So I think that is an important part. But again, we're weakened by being told, you know, don't worry about it. The government's keeping you safe. And if they're not keeping us safe, then we're in fact less safe than we would have been if they'd stayed out of it in the first place. 
Yeah, and and you've highlighted, I think, a, an important, a couple important points. I just wanna wanna highlight very briefly. One is defense is different than offense. I, I recognize people conflate too, but people forget that before it was called the Department of Defense, it was called the Department of War, which is a much more accurate title. Defense implies a very passive. We're going to only defend against direct threats to us. The way the apparatus, the empire apparatus in America has evolved is it's, if you look, it, it's, it's largely offensive. It, 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 it projects force out into the world. And the things it projects force out against typically pose almost no threat dire directly to America directly. The problem is national interests have become so broadly defined that it covers the whole globe that justifies any intervention you want. And that's problematic itself. The, the, the other thing is that it, it, what's so hard to push back against this is that it's, it's once something is established and it's a part of life and it becomes normalized and just given the magnitude of the apparatus, those that run the national security state, policymakers and others, it's very easy for them to point to things and say, well, look, this exists. You wouldn't be safe otherwise. And as you were saying, you know, one of the reasons that you and I and others advocate for liberty and freedom, uh, it's, which, is, which is, of course, at its core, valuable unto itself. But there is also the, the kind of consequentialist outcome, which is that it generates good things through time. What are those things? I don't know. That's why we want markets. That's why we want entrepreneurs to figure those things out. If we knew them, we wouldn't need those things. And, you know, F.A. Hayek pointed out one of the difficulties of defending a free society in general is this difference between what he called principle and expediency. And he said, the do-gooders can always promise you concrete stuff if you just give them more power. That's the expediency point. Just give me more money. Give me more of your freedoms and I'll give you X, Y, and Z. And they can always promise these concrete things. And the defenders of freedom and liberty, what we have is principles. We say, here are the principles that define a free society. We have reason to believe that those are desirable, both because we privilege individuals as their own sovereigns, because of individual dignity in itself being valuable. But then, of course, because of these other consequences that will emerge, we have broad arguments for them, but we don't know concrete things. And that's why education about those principles, um, communicating those principles to people is so important in Hayek's telling. Um, and, and, you know, one other thing I just want to mention when you were talking about the San Francisco event, it made me realize, you know, one of the audiences this book is written to, it's written for a broad audience. So hopefully anyone can get something out of it. But one of the things that I've found quite troubling, going back to 9-11, but even before that, even during the Cold War, is that many proponents of free markets, of freedom in general, have a very big space for government when it comes to national defense. And they'll say things like, I believe in freedom for all these other, in all these other areas, but we need government to provide national defense, to provide the foundations of a free society, and so on. And... That might be the case, but in giving up that ground, I think that a lot of very smart, dedicated proponents of freedom have given significant ground over to the left because the left are the only remaining critics, for the most part, of a empire-type apparatus, but they also, to my view, make the quite mistaken claim that empire and imperialism is tied in and entangled with capitalism. Uh, and, and in order to push back against that, we need a systematic and coherent defense about how the root cause of all this is not capitalism. It's not markets. It's not entrepreneurship. It is the state apparatus. And that's one of the things I'm trying to get people to, to think about and internalize. Um, and so that backlash that you and I were talking about earlier in, in foreign countries against freedom and capitalism also happens domestically. Um, where, where, where these things uh, uh, become entangled. And then in order to get rid of or push back against imperialism, people say you need to push back against capitalism and free markets. And I think that is completely wrong and quite dangerous. And so one of the things I hope to, to make clear in the book is that those things are not entangled. They are separate things and that you can have markets, you can have the goods crossing borders, as you put it, but also not have imperialism. Um, and one does not require the other. Well, Chris, I really thank you for being just a stellar communicator of these principles and ideas. You're, you just go from one great thing to the next, and we're so grateful to 
get to collaborate with you on these projects and appreciate your giving me the time today. Well, thank you. And thank you for all you do. And it's a, it's an honor and a privilege to work with you. And I, I look forward to continuing to do so. Great. Take care. Thank you.